It's wild to think I'm living in a world right now where federal agents are roaming the streets of my city like a modern Gestapo and snatching people left and right without saying a word about where they're being taken or even why they're being taken. To the point where I've caught myself looking over my shoulder anytime I'm downtown due to the paranoia they have plunged this city into. Watching from the sidelines or the back of the crowd as the monsters in the Portland Police Bureau tear gas pregnant women, tackle and beat any protesters they can get their hands on, fire riot control munitions at point blank range, leaving them bleeding and critically injured has made me feel as if I'm in some nightmarish version of reality. But as much as it chills me to admit it, this is reality. 2020 had already claimed its place as arguably the most horrific year that I and so many others have lived through due to the coronavirus pandemic and the American government's utter refusal to do a goddamn thing about it. The war crimes that have been committed against those protesting the murder of George Floyd and so many innocent black souls, the Trump administration making their ties to white supremacy and fascism ever clearer, worsening climate change and civil unrest. Any one of these events would have made for a historic year, but in the midst of the universe throwing all kinds of hell at us, it found room to hit us with one more cheap shot. We all need to understand the gravity of what's happening in Portland. This is not a flash in the pan or an isolated incident. Our government has been using the star-spangled fist of the military to crush any and all people's uprisings for over a century now, and the American flag has been seen by many as a symbol of warfare waged against its people in the world, ethnic cleansing, and fascism. This is what our country was built upon, and millions of people are finally waking up to that historical fact. But even when looking back at events like Standing Rock, the military response to the Ferguson protests and federal raids on indigenous lands and other cities, what's happening right now feels especially sinister. Ken Cuccinelli, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, told NPR in an interview that not only are they not stopping their tactics in collaboration with police in Portland, they're planning on taking them nationwide. And President Trump himself has already hinted at his desire towards sitting in the military to fight the violent anarchists and Marxists who are taking over our cities. Which, yeah, that's kind of what we're building towards, yeah? But this is your government openly admitting that they're planning a full authoritarian takeover of the country of us. I mentioned previously in my video on America's authoritarian police states how cops are the government's primary method of protecting property and capital and quelling any and all social unrest through whatever methods are deemed necessary. What's happening right now involves not just the police, but federal agents, the military itself, and every single arm of the government. It is all aimed directly at the head of the people, and they're just itching to pull the trigger. I'd be lying if I said I'm not scared. Genuinely. I've heard stories from my parents about what life was like during the civil rights movement, how they witnessed the country become consumed by the fire of those who'd been repressed, enslaved, oppressed, and had finally had enough, and how the military swept in and attacked indiscriminately. Americans at the time had been gripped by paranoia and a state of fear, and it's surreal knowing that I myself am living through a similar era, that I'm witnessing history with my own eyes, and seeing an awakening of class consciousness and an embracing of true intersectionality amongst those who either rarely or never engaged with political activism before the George Floyd protests began. Feels like we're now reaching a turning point, and there's a growing understanding that these issues affect not just anarchists, leftists in general, and ethnic minorities, but broader contingents of working and middle-class people. The atmosphere is volatile, it's uncertain, it's terrifying, it's exciting, and every fight that's happening right now is in service of every single soul in this country. We recognize that America has never truly been free, and that if we don't do what needs to be done at this moment in time, it'll either pull us down into true authoritarianism or pull us from its grip and set us on the path towards a truly socialist society, a dictatorship of the proletariat. America is under siege, and we must acknowledge what happens when you choose not to act despite seeing every warning sign of creeping fascism and authoritarianism. For example, let's take a look back at the state of the Weimar Republic in 1933 at the birth of the Nazi Empire. Hitler and 
his racist nationalist regime were able to secure dictatorial control by restoring economic stability and ending mass unemployment during the height of the Great Depression, and using his charisma and formidable talent as a speaker to pull millions into his grasp. His campaign had already used the veneer of populism to convince the public that the individual had value only in their membership in the collective racial community and promised to restore Germany to its former greatness and make Germany great again. All of these seeds were planted in order to subtly indoctrinate the public into his ideology of racism, eugenics, and anti-Semitism, the idea that Germanic peoples were the master race, and that certain people needed to be exterminated in order for Germany to be pure, strong, and beautiful, thus setting the stage for the genocide of both the Jewish and Romani people, but his targets included far more than just ethnic communities. The Nazis demanded that Germans accept the premises of their worldview and live their lives accordingly. They tolerated no criticism, no dissent, and no nonconformity. They were determined to destroy the Marxist threats as described by them and eliminate the Versailles Treaty, both of which were aims shared widely by the public. How often do you hear people like Dennis Prager, Jordan Peterson, and Ben Shapiro use the term cultural Marxism? Did you ever wonder where that came from. Political opponents such as communists, social democrats, and socialists who had been labeled with the infamous upside-down red triangle, spiritual opponents such as Jehovah's Witnesses, and even social opponents such as homosexuals were all told by the Nazis that they had to understand their racial value and then follow their restored natural instincts to do the right thing, except the Nazi worldview or be seen as an enemy of the state and labeled as political dissidents. And in order to enforce his long-term goals of ethnic cleansing and the unification of Germany into one collective race and national ideology, Ermann Göring, Hitler's second-in-command, established the Gestapo, the official secret police of Nazi Germany and German-occupied Europe. After filling its rank with Nazis, Göring wanted to integrate all police forces under his control, to where there would no longer be separate municipal police forces and federal officers. They would all be one unit bent on the iron rule over the populace. And practically every judicial and legislative barrier was removed so the Gestapo could easily enforce whatever it is Hitler deemed necessary. They were given the authority to investigate cases of treason, espionage, sabotage, and criminal attacks on the Nazi party and Germany. The basic Gestapo law passed by the government in 1936 gave the Gestapo carte blanche to operate without judicial review. In effect, putting them above the law. SS officer Werner Best and the one-time head of legal affairs within the Gestapo was quoted as saying, as long as the police carries out the will of the leadership, it is acting legally. Much like we're already seeing in Portland, they were given the ability to use Schutzhaft, or protective custody, a euphemism for the power to imprison people without judicial proceedings. You ever notice how often words hold we're not supposed to question the authority of the police, and that to do so makes you a danger to public safety? and that if you're detained, it's definitely 100% your fault, totally reasonable, and something that would absolutely happen in a free country? Fascinating how often these things repeat in a fascistic society. Isn't it? This sick, dictatorial mindset is what granted the Gestapo the power to arrest whomever they deemed a target and throw them in concentration camps indefinitely. Over 100,000 Germans were imprisoned throughout 1933, and between 500 and 600 were killed. And after securing their hold on the German people, they turned their attention to the Jews at the order of Hitler and began the first stages of the Holocaust. And it all started when a leader decided he would do whatever was necessary to cement his power, whether it's deny the results of elections, other immigrants, the black community, anarchists, Marxists, and communists in order to turn the populist against them and weaponize nationalistic and militaristic rhetoric to give the illusion that the country is under attack from an outside force that seeks to destroy their national identity, freedom, heritage, and values, and thus must be 
be vanquished. Fascism doesn't loudly announce itself when it first begins its descent into the heart of a society, because no one ideology will ever effectively subdue a populace if the wolves are immediately scratching at the door. By using echoes of nationalism, fascists can work their way into vulnerable minds and indoctrinate them into the belief that they are a chosen people who have gained power and privilege through their bloodline, and that this bloodline must be protected at all costs. Effectively scared and seduced, the people will then begin giving up one right after another because the government promises that it's a necessary sacrifice in order to secure their liberty. If protesters are attacked and crushed, we're told it was because those protesters were a danger to public safety. They'll use every tool at their disposal to counter what they deem misinformation and convince the public that only they speak the truth and only they should be listened to. What's happening on Fox News right now? They are the one voice of truth and everyone else is the enemy. And if outspoken political opponents begin disappearing, well, it's for the greater good. At its heart, fascism is, as a friend put it, colonialism turned inwards, and a way of allowing those in power to invade and recolonize or re-educate areas and people that have resisted their rule. The Gestapo were domestic terrorists tasked with enforcing the will of the state, and unbeknownst to many, we in America have had numerous versions of the Gestapo for some time now, one of which is a private military company known as Blackwater. Founded in 1996 as a military training camp by ex-Navy SEAL and former CIA asset Eric Prince. Blackwater over the next decade became perhaps the most powerful mercenary firm in the U.S., something the Bush administration views as the necessary revolution in military affairs, the outsourcing of armed forces. And those contracted by it were given access to sensitive intelligence that even the intelligence committee itself typically wouldn't have access to. Murder for hire in service of the military industrial complex, essentially. During an interview with NPR, Jeremy Scahill, author of the book Blackwater, said, U.S. taxpayers are now funding what is essentially a shadow army, and the operations of these companies are often shrouded in secrecy and are very difficult to obtain information on by journalists and the U.S. Congress. No oversights, no barriers, the ability to do whatever they feel needs to be done in order to fulfill the orders of their masters. To date, actual evidence of what Blackwater was doing at home and abroad remains scant, but Scahill revealed they were planning targeted assassinations and kidnappings of Taliban and Al-Qaeda suspects, and that Blackwater operatives had also run a secret U.S. military drone bombing campaign that runs parallel to the CIA's predator strikes. The military and federal cops working together to further American imperialism at the conquest of our fascist leaders. Sounds familiar, huh? Reports of excessive use of violence and the killings of civilians by Blackwater operatives began to bubble to the surface until the now infamous Nisir Square massacre occurred in Baghdad on September 16th, 2007, in which Blackwater agents began firing unprovoked on Iraqi citizens in a crowded intersection, killing 17 in the process. And we still don't actually know how many people have been killed by Blackwater. We don't know how many foreign targets they've killed or how many other countries and or political situations they've interfered in. We don't know how many other shadow organizations are operating as we speak within our borders and outside. Despite worldwide condemnation, only a small handful of Blackwater operatives were tried and sentenced, and Prince himself escaped the clutches of punishments. There was an opportunity to stop him in his tracks, but of course the U.S. government wouldn't dare harm one of their most valuable assets. In 2017, it came to light that the Trump administration was weighing the creation of a private network of spies by former Blackwater founder Eric Prince, a former CIA officer and famous Iran-Contra scandal figure Oliver North, which would gather information for CIA Director Mike Pompeo and the White House and keep the rest of the U.S. intelligence community in the dark of what it discovers, according to a report by The Intercept. Its purpose was to circumvent the deep states, a term widely used to describe longtime officials within the government who seemingly possess a political agenda meant to 
undermine an administration. Political dissidents, enemies of the states, protesters, ordinary citizens. And look how often Trump points to more liberal cities and accuses their people of working for the deep state and being guilty of trying to destroy America and plunge our society into all-out anarchy. Those cities are the ones actively opposing Trump's attempts to wrestle power away from them and full of far left-leaning activists like ourselves. If he gets his way, he brags like he's done on live television about the great job that federal officers are doing in Portland, and if he doesn't, he goes on a tirade about the violent Antifa mob that's taking over and how his supporters need to rise up against them. And we understand the subtext of what he's saying here, right? But it takes more than a dehydrated Cheeto in a vest to sway us, and a hell of a lot more than a coward with a gun to scare us. The nationwide protests have been going for nearly 60 days strong at this point, and despite the absolute brute force being inflicted upon protesters by the Portland Police Bureau and federal agents, as well as others across the country, they've reorganized, become reinvigorated, returned night after night after night, and sent the loudest possible message that no matter what, they will not back down. Down. We're becoming more educated, more knowledgeable about how to fight state repression, have learned who not to trust, how not to organize, and how to defend ourselves, and recognize that even if the immediate gain of going isn't significant, we must do it because it is an enormous learning experience for every single one of us. But the realization that a modern day Gestapo is patrolling our streets as we speak is certainly a terrifying prospect. It doesn't help that the Trump campaign released 88 emails with 14 words in the first sentence weeks ago stating their intention to designate Antifa as a terrorist organization while placing the familiar upside down red triangle at the top of each email, sending a bullhorn to their white supremacist followers who are no doubt chomping at the bit to see protesters shot dead in the streets. Isn't it funny that those same followers were up in arms, literally, when conspiracy theories around Jade Helm and a supposed impending takeover of the South by Obama's troops began spreading like wildfire in 2016, and the whole of conservative media was screaming about how they didn't want the government implementing martial law and violating their rights, but now that the government is quite literally doing both, they've either become silent or have thrown their weight behind Trump in his decision to bring the military in. Fascism for for thee and not for me, is how they seem to view all of this and act as if somehow they've been granted special favor in the eyes of the government. Um, I hate to break it to them, but the people are a means to an end in fascist governments. They do not care about us. Get it through y'all's heads. We at the front lines have been yelling this at the top of our lungs, only for you to jab your fingers in your ears and yell even louder. And because we apparently have to keep reminding people of this, Antifa is not an organization. It is a movement of ordinary people fighting against the presence of fascism in our country. And those people could be mothers, families, your neighbors, the disillusioned and looked down upon in marginalized communities, everyone affected in some way by our worsening socioeconomic conditions, political activists. There's no one way to be anti-fascist except to understand who it is we're opposed to and why we're doing what we're doing. We're not terrorists or people bent on destruction for the sake of destruction. We don't want this country to become even worse of an authoritarian hellhole and are desperately trying to bring awareness of how we we're following in the footsteps of dictatorships from the past. My community is not safe. Minorities of all kinds are not safe. Political dissidents, people who rightfully disagree with what the government is doing, are being painted as enemies of the state. And too many of y'all are just falling in line and accepting it. You're going to stand by as ordinary people start showing up missing, as cities and states are locked down and put under full militaristic control, and more of your own autonomy and rights disappear, and as more and more citizens begin cheering for the blood of their enemies to be spilled. Dehumanized and turned into pawns of the state by falling for the propaganda propaganda that tells you people like myself are a threat that needs to be eliminated. You are opening the door to a full authoritarian takeover of this country, which includes you.
lest we forget. But Trump promised you he'd make the country great again. Uh, great again how? By bathing the street in the blood of protesters, people of color, and indigenous communities, by indoctrinating young prying minds into hailing the glories of American exceptionalism, nationalism, and the supremacy of the white man in uniform, and pulling us back into an era in which forms of political dissident were declared illegal and protesters were painted by traitors who were hunted down by the CIA and other shadowy forces. Listen, what I've witnessed with my own eyes in Portland has proved beyond the shadow of a doubt to me that we live in a police state, that the cops and feds have no interest whatsoever in protecting the peace and the people, that what they're doing is shooting first and asking questions later, leaving dozens of protesters seriously injured, carried off in the back of a dark van to some unknown destination, unsure if they'll be questioned, tortured, killed. As of yet, every protester kidnapped has been returned unharmed, but that doesn't excuse what's happening. Trump has openly said he wants to see an escalation in militaristic force against us, and at this point, we don't know if or when those kidnappings will turn into ordinary people being shipped off to concentration camps. We don't know if they've already begun intentionally targeting specific people of specific backgrounds, ethnicities, political orientations. We don't no, and this is why we all need to understand that we are alone in this. Who do we have to protect ourselves against the full might of the government? No one. We the people are all we have. We protect us. Remember, a state in decline will use the last of its remaining power to maintain control, and they are expertly organized and ready to combat us at every turn. We must be aware of all of the ways in which this government will try to disarm us, whether through the stripping of our weapons or through the stifling of our speech and ability to organize. Karl Marx was quoted as saying, under no pretext should arms and ammunition be surrendered, and any attempt to disarm the workers must be frustrated by force if necessary. And Chris Carrara, in a piece called An Anarchist Case Against Gun Control, wrote, Free people must be free to arm and defend themselves with the weapons they choose, while making all of society less violent by changing the social conditions which be various source of predation and abolishing political coercion is the best way to stop aggressive acts. Until then, people should be able to have access to the means to defend themselves, including firearms. There's the old argument of who would be more likely to allow fascism to take hold of America, conservatives or liberals, and I've leaned towards liberals due to their willful defanging of protesters, radical voices, and social movements, all in the name of respectability politics, and not rocking the boat too hard. And they've wrapped millions up in the idea that banning weapons and other forms of protest and defense will somehow leave us safer? Not only that, but the banning of weapons would lead our ruling class, whether they be conservative, liberal, whatever, they're all exactly the same anyways, directly to people like you and I. The radical Antifa mob your mom warned you about. Anyone who tells you to do something because it's in your best interest, but is perhaps a wee bit wealthier, wider, and uh, you know, politically inclined to their rights is someone you maybe shouldn't trust. But more importantly, recognize an illegal occupation when you see one. What's happening in Portland is what cities all over the world have experienced when the devils of the US military descended upon them. And we must prepare for the government to make a much stronger push to suffocate the raging fire that is growing ever brighter. My intention is not to make a one-on-one -on -one comparison between the Gestapo and what the feds are doing, but I want all of you to recognize the similarities in their methods and the sheer danger of that connection alone. They want you to waive your Miranda rights. They want you to cave into the pressure they're crushing you with. This is the state and class struggle both in action. And only through an intersectional approach and a nation standing together in solidarity are we going to have any chance of resisting the oncoming takeover. The middle class has to fight with us. What we're fighting right now to stop is the censoring of even more moderate voices that don't fit within the paradigm of either the conservative or neoliberal worldview. We're fighting for them too. And if they refuse to assist us in adding our bodies and voices to the movement against police and state brutality, and the movement to fully abolish the police, we shouldn't organize around them because it isn't in our best interest to do so. This is the one time when they are very much against us if they refuse to stand 
with us. Conspiracy theories around the country splitting or another civil war erupting in the streets no longer seem like conspiracy theories. And we've seen movements of white nationalists coalescing behind Trump and the feds. We've seen the very clear language used by the Trump administration to label those who oppose fascism as terrorists and label them as political dissidents. And we've seen their desire to bring back the methods used in events like the Palmer Raids. Just because something hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it never will. Don't ever fall for the government's attempts to coddle you and bring you to their side. They are not here to protect you. They are sure as hell not here to serve you. You're of use to them for their own ends. And the only thing that will ever stop them from tightening the leash around your neck is to cut it off, put your foot down, and refuse to heal whenever they demand you obey. We're not fucking slaves. We're people who are hurting, worn down, and absolutely done with being exploited, killed, arrested, oppressed, colonized, whitewashed, neutered, stolen from, and told we have to settle for whatever they deem fit for society. They're going to understand that this is our fucking country, that if you invade our lands like you've done to countless ones overseas, we the people will not back down without a fight, and they will not stop until every last one of us are dead. All power to the people. Keep up the good fights. And stay safe out there, comrades. We've got a long, horrific night and an unimaginable fight ahead of us, and it's going to test and push us unlike anything we've ever experienced. But this is the nature of war, and our government has declared war upon us. We either fight back or we lose everything. In the past, I would have said that in a somewhat hyperbolic way, but I'm dead serious now. And we've been warning about this moment, but we were called hysterical fear mongers and America-hating anarchists, which isn't entirely false by any number of evangelical and conservative mouthpieces. There will be millions who continue to do as Trump commands and see us as their mortal enemy. We cannot let that distract or slow us down. What matters at this moment is that we all focus Focus on what's ahead. The fight against an increasingly militarized police state. The fight against the intentional targeting of all those who oppose Trump. The fight against the further stoking of racism and civil war. And the culmination of a centuries-long battle between the people and their oppressors. Fight against any and all co-opters of our movements. Don't allow our message to be lost. It's going to get ugly. We've got to stick together and look out for one another. So long as the people have and fight for each other, we're already off to a hell of a good start. Now, let's finish the fights.